Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's very timely talk about the implications of the military coup in Myanmar. Um, before we begin, we'd like to ask that you send any more questions for the panel to question at fcchk.org. That's question at fcchk.org. And do head to our website, fcchk.org, to see other um, .com to see other upcoming talks by Bob Woodward and Evan Osnos. Um, today, we are so grateful to have with us three guests on the ground in Myanmar, which has been racked by weeks of protests with three deaths so far, known deaths so far, and uh, internet blackouts. So connection may be spotty for some, so um, we will try to accommodate them first. Um, but to give us further insights into the situation, we have Ali Fau, a freelance documentary filmmaker and broadcast journalist specializing in Southeast Asian affairs. She has worked for the Democratic Voice of Burma, the BBC and CNA. Originally from Edinburgh, she has lived and worked in the region since 2009. She has produced hard hitting films, investigating numerous subjects from the illicit drugs trade, devastating Myanmar's conflict torn border regions to the secretive jade mining industry in Kachin State. We also have with us Manny Mong, a researcher with Human Rights Watch who has worked closely with Rohingya in Myanmar and Bangladesh. Prior to that, she was a journalist whose work appeared in CNN, Al Jazeera, Myanmar Times, ABC, and others. Her recent dispatches for HRW spotlight the pandemic's impact on displaced people in Myanmar, and rising arrests of citizens without charge since the Tamado took over. And we have with us human rights advocate and lawyer Wei Wei Nu. She was imprisoned by the government as a teenager because of her father's political affiliation and activism. And since her release in 2012, dedicated herself to working for democracy and human rights and women's rights. She is the founder and executive director of the Women's Peace Network and founder for Justice for Women. And moderating today's panel is uh, Washington Post, Hong Kong Bureau Chief Shibari Mutani, and my fellow governor, at, board governor at the FCC. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Christine. <clears throat> and thank you so much to our panelists. A special thanks to Ali, who has somehow found a way to call in uh, despite an ongoing internet blackout in Myanmar. Um, Ali, we'll, we'll go to you first. Uh, I'm conscious of the uh, connection and the fact that you might drop off at any time. So um, maybe you could give us a sense of the situation on the ground. I, I know you've been covering the protests, um, you know, since since they began, really. And uh, today, I, I know we're expected to see massive protests uh, and a very large um, strike, um, you know, as part of the civil disobedience movement. So maybe you can give us a, a sense of that first. Yeah, um, it's been a a real roller coaster here um, emotionally and um, also in terms of fear and tension um, as the days have gone on. Um, initially, after the, the, the in the first few days after the military takeover, there was um, a, a huge amount of tension and fear um, as obviously news of arrests were coming in. And people were very reluctant to speak, nervous about going to the street. And now um, the, we've seen obviously huge numbers come to the street. The atmosphere has actually been um, almost festival-like at times, but as we've seen the crackdowns happening in other parts of town, and as there's been increased security presence here in Yangon, um, that nervousness has been creeping back in. And also the, the, the kind of, um, the momentum has decreased a little bit and the num we've seen numbers drop. Uh, we've got a lot of young people still going out every day. We've still got large presence of uh, protesters outside uh, the embassies, outside the UN building here, um, and outside the, the central bank, which is where there are some tanks and uh, military um, vehicles stationed. So there's been a lot of opposition to that. Obviously people are making themselves heard and vocalizing their displeasure at the military presence. So there are still pockets of, of intense uh, um, protest activity, but 
overall it's been a bit reduced so i think that's why there's this call today um and definitely as always is in the morning a lot of uncertainty and nervousness um especially at the moment we're getting these nightly black blackouts so we don't really know what's happened in the night you know you wake up in the morning and normally you've got a couple of messages that maybe came through before before the internet went off at 1 a.m saying that roads are blocked and that there's a lot of movement security forces and because this big protest is planned um definitely there's a, a lot of anxiety and uncertainty here but quite often once you get out onto the street it it the atmosphere is almost jubilant and it becomes there's a real safety and numbers feeling mm -hmm. and there's there's such a kind of i mean it's almost like I said, it's almost festival, like you get people playing music. Sometimes there are people with guitars, you know, and, and it can actually be quite uplifting um, to be around those kind of moments. Um, but we've also seen these standoffs, you know, like in Lairdam, which is um, uh, slightly north of the center of the city. Um, there's been a huge movement there most days. Um, and that's where one of the biggest police and and sometimes military presence have been seen. Um, there are water cannons there most days. And so there's a big kind of stand up, uh, standoff around Ledan Junction between protesters and um, police there most days. And that, so that does sometimes feel quite tense. But as days have gone on and there hasn't been a crackdown in Yangon, at least, people are feeling uh, on the streets still quite, quite, I think quite emboldened um, mm -hmm. but then you get home and you get the news you get the social media you see what's been happening in in Napidor and Mandalay we've had several deaths now and this the, these night fears are, are very intense in Yangon as well what's going to happen at night are there going to be nightly arrests are there going to be gangs of newly released prisoners um, you know trying to burn down your building lots of rumors mm -hmm. which then leads to this sort of vigilante movement. So, like I said, it's a roller coaster of emotions here, and and also, yeah, and tension. I think is one of the the words that I keep coming back to because even in moments where people do start to feel safety in numbers, there's always this like underlying tension, especially considering so many people know what's happened in the past and they know what the military is capable of and how they've reacted to protest movements before. Yeah. Uh... Very interesting. Um, Manny, I, I know for Human Rights Watch, you've done, uh, you know, some some reports and investigations uh, on on the recent uh, deaths that we've seen on the streets and of, of protesters. Um, maybe you can talk a, a little bit to that and, um, you know, tell us what it's done for, for, for the protest movement, uh, how it's sort of given it um, a, a new kind of urgency um, or invigorated it. Well, I think it's really made people angry, you know, um, We've expected stronger crackdowns, but I think what we've seen is that the military, this regime is, is very patient and they're biding their time. And, you know, what we can expect is that they're watching, they're looking for the, the leaders who are organizing, whether it's from a grassroots perspective or whether they suspect that they're doing it from a more um, structured way. Um, We've seen people galvanize on the streets even without internet connection because they've been able to communicate to each other in various forms. But I think the shootings have been really the linchpin in all of this where it has really damaged, um, you know, the expectations of what the international community might have hoped the military would be able to respond in a bit more of a, a reasoned or even handed way. Um, but certainly I think people are really angry and, and fair enough because, you know, two of the major incidents that have happened now where we've seen lethal force used and people killed are very young people, um, you know, teenagers. And these are the people who are leading the CDM protests whether or not we want to say that they're organized by the CSOs and grassroots levels, it's clear that um, the young people are the ones who are driving this. They don't want to be living under a military coup again. Um, you know, you asked about the investigations and it's difficult. Our, our information is piecemeal. You know, we might be getting some things in real time where people are posting when they can or sending us messages when they can. 
but the verifying process is really difficult and I think everyone's finding that and I mean today you know it's it's remarkable that Ali can call in because really we, we're under a blackout, Myanmar's under a blackout, and it's really concerning when we're thinking about the fact that there were messages broadcast on state media yesterday threatening to shoot peaceful mm. protesters. So on top of all of that, that fear and that concern is fed by this propaganda machine that is really um, now actively threatening us. Yeah. Uh, Wei Wei, uh, you know, there's a obvious link here between uh, the crackdown that we saw on the Rohingya in uh, 2017, including um, by some of the same forces, right? The Light Infantry Division uh, 77 and 33. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about, about those, those, those troops, what we know about them, their role in, in uh, you know, what happened with, with the Rohingya crackdown. And uh, you know what, what we're seeing now in terms of their response to these peaceful protesters uh, gathering in, in, in Mandalay and, and Naypyidaw. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me and thank you for the opportunity to discuss here. Um, so yes, um, it is quite terrifying to see this um, light infantry division uh, 3399 uh, are in major city of Myanmar in Yangon and in Mandalay, they are roaming around. It's, um, you know, for, for us, you know, knowing that how brutal this um, military could be, um, it is quite terrifying to see. And I also realized uh, last few days, few days ago, people were like taking selfie with these, uh, you know, with the big armored vehicles as if, you know, these like you know like basically I'm not sure how the Burmese people in Arvin area understand how brutal this can be although they are aware mm -hmm. of the they're aware of the history uh, in in you know in 1997 uh, I mean in, in 2007 or in 1996 97 or in 1988 or all of this uh, you know previous uh, revolutions and uprisings the military were quite brutal they do understand um, somehow the military can be brutal, but in terms of specific these divisions, you know how brutal they can be. I'm not quite sure whether they 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 kind of feel in um, uh, having people uh, kind of you know uh, how do we say that really. Um, it, it's for me, it's scary, right? And for many of us, it's scary, but I'm not sure how people are feeling about in Yangon state, especially in 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 Avon area in Yangon or Mandalay, and seeing. Um, people taking selfie with them, you know, not everybody, but, you know, a couple of pictures came up. It's been quite frustrating. And you can also see the um, military yesterday, the SAC actually warned public people, the protesters and, and young people, uh, as if they will lose their life if they continue to do so um, on the MRTV, Myanmar televisions. And at the same time, they have uh, deployed these armored ve vehicles and all this, uh, the, the, the light infantry divisions in, in Yangon city and big city. So, um, so basically, you know, there are signals, they are signaling them we are going to be brutal. And they have already, uh, you know, deployed uh, military and, and um, the military, uh, this, uh, you know, brutal divisions and even um, even like they they actually painted the the armored vehicle to police vehicle by painting white color to that and put in the police uh, uh, like letter on the vehicle. So it is very unclear what is going to happen today. People are organizing this big um, protest, huge protest today um, uh, for 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 today, 20, 22nd um, February uh, twenty. 21, uh, they call it like, you know, two, five, like 22, two, and, um, you know, 2021, they, they, they just call it two, two, five, two. Um, and then they are organizing it at the same time, the military is aware of what people are going to be doing today. And they have already warned uh, on the, on the MRTV. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm very concerned about today and knowing uh, what this, um, the military divisions can be uh, how they could uh, treat uh, the people 
and they are actually, you know, this uh, specifically light infantry divisions uh, 33 is responsible for the crimes that um, committed against Rohingya in 2016 and 2017, as well as in many other ethnic uh, areas. So it's it's very, very terrifying. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ali, maybe maybe you can talk to us a little bit about the civil disobedience movement and the impact it's already had. Um, what is it What is it aiming to do? Um, you know, what 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 is its hope um, in terms of, of achieving or kind of delegitimizing uh, the the military government? And what kind of impact have you already seen on the streets um, in terms of you know the closures of banks and 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 so on? Right, uh, is quite tangible um, that, that that this movement's having some impact. Absolutely. I mean, this is definitely a very new strategy from from the protesters or from from the movement itself. Um, and, and we are seeing an impact. And this is, I think, what a lot of the youth are saying is going to make this time different. This is what's going to make it possible for change to happen that, you know, there's a lot of positivity from uh, protest leadership and so on. Uh, that, that, that this time they can make a difference. And the, CD, the CDM, the Civil Disobedience Movement, is really the heart of that because so many people have joined and there's been these intimidation techniques um, from the military tr and the police and authorities trying to arrest people who are taking part in the Civil Disobedience Movement. But it's really actually hasn't been having the impact that they were expecting. The, the, the movement itself is having an impact. As you say, banks are closed. I mean, that's for me the, the clearest example um, right now of, of how um, much of, a, of an effect it's having because people can't access cash. You know, we, people can't, that we, it's largely a cash economy still here in Myanmar. Um, lots of people rely on, on cash. There has been a, a trickle in of mobile banking. Um, mobile money is still working, so that's kind of keeping things afloat. And a lot of people, in anticipation of this all happening, did get a lot of money out. So people do have cash reserves. Some of them have them anyway because it's a cash economy. People are always expecting something like this to happen. So at the moment, everyone's just kind of riding on adrenaline and feels like it's going to happen. And, and when you do speak to... Um, to protesters or raise this issue of well, what happens when no one can get any cash out anymore on what happens when the economy kind of rolls to a halt that that's actually what they want that's what they want to achieve and so they feel excited by that and like or, or kind of um they feel like if people are scared then that's good because it's showing the society can't shut down and that's really what they're trying to achieve they're trying to show the military government we will not function as a society under your rule we will not work for you we will not um continue you, you cannot ha run the country you cannot life cannot continue under your leadership because we won't accept it and we are so unhappy about it that we have with that we're ready for the whole country to come to a standstill but i do think that there are some very vulnerable people who are going to be impacted much uh, more than others, as is always the case with this sort of thing. Um, we're hearing news that, that some of the banks are already um, really in a kind of crisis situation. Uh, it's possible they're all going to crash. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there are other places that are also suffering. Um, obviously, a lot of the, the government offices have closed down. We'll see what happens come payday, what kind of impact that's going to have, because a lot of people at the moment, they're, you know, when I ask people about it on the street and say, are you not worried? You see a lot of, of, of civil servants out there in groups together in solidarity with their co-workers. And you say, well, what, you know, what's going to happen, you know, when... <laughs> like the, the, for example, Yangon City Development Council, when that shuts down, you, Yangon City Development Council is in charge of water distribution, in charge of garbage collection. Oh, and they say, don't worry, you know, we, we, people are sorting that, we're being fed by the people because there's so, there's such a huge volunteer movement here, people handing out food daily and water bottles. So these people are being fed and watered, but that at some point is presumably going to run dry as well. And so I think there will be a crisis moment um, from this civil disobedience movement. And, um, and I think there will be a lot of families that are gonna to have to reassess when it comes to payday, when they're not, not able to access their payment, when they realize that this, is going to have a, a bigger impact on just them, maybe on their families, 
so on and 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 these these youth who are full of enthusiasm who are like i said before emboldened by the lack of response i mean way way pointing out there about um people taking selfies in in front of um military vehicles I mean, i don't think that's just naivety and a misunderstanding of how of how the military can react although there's some of that there it's it's defiance it's it's when those vehicles arrived people were nervous of them they stood back but as they as they continued to stay there and not move and and i do think that you can gauge i mean you guys will have seen in hong kong as well like you can gauge when there's going to be pushback from authorities you can see from their mood when they're gearing up to something and that's when we see nervousness in Ledan and parts of things when there's been movement of the water cannon or attaching of the of the of the hoses and you feel like something's going to happen whereas these guys they're just static and they it's quite clear that they're not going to do anything so as they've remained there for now anyway obviously I don't know what's going to happen in days to come but but while you're outside you can see that nothing's happening and so people are just kind of pushing further and further as they feel um kind of it, it like emboldened and, and enthusiastic by the lack of response there so they're really really pushing as much as they can they're trying to block roads and stuff uh, the irony here is both sides are blocking roads protesters are blocking roads the police and the authorities are blocking roads protesters are trying to stop the the civil disobedience or per, per, um people who work for the government government offices who are not actively taking part in civil disobedience stop them getting to work so they're trying to kind of uh uh stop those few people who are still complying or engaging with with the regime uh from from being able to do that from being able to get to their offices um but then the military is also trying to stop the protesters moving around or the or the government the um, government's trying to stop the protests moving around so there's a a weird sort of dual <laughs> um mm. system with trying to stop the movement around the city which has also been semi-effective although it does it's normally it's mostly just increased traffic and slowed people down it hasn't really stopped people there's always another route um but yeah we're if we're feeling it acutely here it's definitely it feels like something's brewing and whether it's going to be today at this huge protest movement which is expected and the general strike as well like all all um shops are expected to close today there's yeah. pretty much expected to be shut down today and i don't know what kind of impact that's going to have um that we haven't seen in previous days because a, a lot of shops and private businesses have still been functioning until now and so perhaps today we'll see another knock-on effect from that um but yeah it's very real very effective a lot of people supporting it um I, I, sorry, I'm, too, I'm waffling on, but one thing I do have a, a quite a strong concern about is um, what I've seen in the past in Myanmar, I've worked with Myanmar for a long time, is that sometimes there can be moments where if something is seen to be for the cause, you know, as part of a dem like a democracy movement or, or, or you know, a movement for freedom and, and something negative then happens. People are reluctant to report it, including local media, because media are, are part of this cause, because just by being journalists and being media, they are in a way standing up for freedom of expression and a lot of the rights that they feel they'll lose. The military. And so if, for example, we do start to see a catastrophic effect from the civil disobedience movement and a lot of suffering possibly deaths i mean hospitals are also involved in this we're talking about people who have been ejected from hospitals a lack of health care if if that does start to have a very negative effect on ordinary people my concern is that it won't be reported because reporting on that will be seen as um kind of going against the movement and 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 doing something negative for the cause as opposed to supporting it and that's what's concerning and in the meantime the military leadership they have their own hospitals the military have their own hospitals they have their own systems they live in these compounds far away they're all based in Napidor and that's part of why they designed Napidor and moved there in the first place so they could kind of be safely there out of the way of these popular movements and other things so i do think a lot of the impact is going to be on ordinary people and it could be much more catastrophic than we're we're expecting and and hopefully what what the, the the idea is that that will push 
the military into responding, into backing down. But, you know, a, a lot of us that have worked in Myanmar for a long time know that that's not really in the nature of the Tamador. And, and the idea that they would change their mind or back down, they'd lose a lot of face. And it just seems very unlikely. So, yeah, it's going to just keep pushing forward, I think, until a, until a crisis point. That's my personal concern and, and feeling right now. Yeah, uh, those are all very, very good points, and I think something that um, us, us in Hong Kong, who've, uh, who've also watched watched the protests and, and the sort of burn it all down kind of mentality, can um, can 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 relate to, right? Um, so we 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 actually already have some some questions, uh, you know, uh, coming in, and, and I do want to give give some time to uh, our audience to to ask questions. So I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna jump into that um, right now. Um, a question for both uh, Manny and Weiwei. Um, I, I'll, I'll let um, perhaps Manny answer first, and then and then Wei Wei. Um, how might the the Rohingya and ethnic minorities be treated differently under a, a, a military regime? I know that's been a sort of complicated issue. Um, that obviously, the 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 military, the Tamado, has been trying to exploit um, you know different feelings among ethnic groups and trying to get them on side. Um, you know, uh, sort of exploiting uh, some of these ne negative feelings towards the the NLD that that had been brewing for for a number of years. Um, Manny, maybe you can speak to sort of the the other uh, ethnic groups, and then we can have uh, where we talk about the the Rohingya um, specifically. Sure. Um, right now, there's you know there's been active conflict in Karen State. For example, I mean, this started before the coup and, um, you know, we had heard that up to 4,000 people had been displaced in the week just before the coup even. And then again, last week, we heard that there were, you know, active conflict around Miawadi area that was unrelated to um, the protests and the strike actions. So civil war continues and it has been continuing and there has been deployment of troops in different areas um, even as the coup has been going. Um, we heard in Liza that there was offensives a couple of weeks ago from by the military. So the ethnic people are very aware of the consequences of what will happen under a military regime. Um, considering that these conflicts have still been going even with an NLD government in place and they were unable to really address that. And certainly the peace, you know, um, the NCA or the National Ceasefire Agreement, I mean, right now is, is debatably, um, you know, in question because we don't know whether this is all going to be null and void in the coming days. Um, you know, what I wanted to speak to you about earlier was as well, like we've seen these laws and these amendments of laws coming in um, very quickly. These, these things like, you know, getting rid of privacy laws, changing the constitution so that men online can actually make null and void any privacy rights, um, any protection rights for human rights. It, it's really concerning. And I do think that the ethnic areas have already suffered quite a bit. So some of the earlier um, clashes that we saw were actually in ethnic areas. So in Michina, for example, last week where, you know, reporters were also arrested among the, among the group of people who were, who were taken and, um, you know, clashes where people, civilians were hurt. Um, we've also recently seen arrests this week of civilians and allegedly two young nurses who were getting ready for a protest and um, they were taken, they were chased by some of the military. I think, you know, just in a way to intimidate and harass and show that mm -hmm. they were willing to, to intimidate and harass these young women and they came back really badly beaten. Um, all that stuff is really, really concerning. So I don't think it bodes well for, for the Rohingya at all. And I mean, I will throw it away because I want her to speak to the, on this more, but if you are considering sending people back to a country that is in active conflict and now under a coup to the same regime who committed these crimes against this ethnic group of people, it just doesn't make sense. And Bangladesh are now trying to send people back and worryingly, they mentioned at the UNSC last week, the UN Security Council, that they would send people back in a dignified and safe manner. Under humanitarian law, you're meant to be able to send them back 
under a dignified, safe and voluntary manner. And very notably, they dropped the voluntary out of it. Now we're seeing from Malaysia that they want to send people back. And these forced deportations are really concerning because we know what's happened to them under this regime. And maybe Weiwei can, can talk more about that. Thank you, Manny, for, for all your insights. I think um, they are very, very right. You are right. I mean, I agree with both of you. Just before that, just to clarify, I wasn't... Um, uh, I didn't think people, young people were naive, but looking, uh, taking picture in front of the armored um, vehicle, but I just felt frustrated to see that. Um, mm. And, and I, it, I, I, I totally agree with you. It's, it's, it's defiance, it's resistance, and people are very, very angry with, by seeing these vehicles and, and the, the military deployed across the main cities. And they are using all their talent and creativity to, uh, reject the military coup. And that's how, you know, even the uh, brutal break, uh, crackdown in Mandalay and Medina um, yesterday, the day before yesterday, and in Nepido, you know, they come back strong with a, uh, with, with a larger number day by day. And that's their defiance and that we are seeing. Um, and that is real. And we really need to pay attention to today. And um, uh, going back to the questions of minority and Rohingya. Um, and, and before that, I also want to highlight one thing here. We are uh, uh, the, um, um, uh, uh, an issue that we are working on at this point is the uh, specific violence uh, against the women and uh, sexual harassment arrest um, uh, of the women. Um, so basically we are seeing women are targeted um, in Mandalay, in Nijina, in Nebido, uh, you know, Nyatoto um, kind was shot dead. And then one thing that struck me a lot is that how women are being um, uh, brutally, violently arrested by male police officer. And which is not only violating international laws, uh, but also violating the domestic laws uh, itself, like the, the criminal procedures or police manuals of Burma. So you know, the, it is um, it is really really uh, yeah, unacceptable to see how women have been brutalized, uh, violently arrested, uh, and intimidated in many ways. And I think this is one thing that we have to we have to highlight. And uh, at the same time, we're also seeing like uh, people from the minority states or people in the urban area are more targeted than the main cities like in Yangon uh, because it's easier for, for to, to, to target or to, to, um, uh, to uh, crack down the people in the, in the smaller cities than in, in, in bigger cities. On the other hand, you know, the nature of the military targeting ethnic minorities, oppressing my ethnic minorities, uh, is 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 their culture and their tradition. That and it, I I can assure you that when the military is able to uh, normalize this coup, then they will start the the persecutions against the ethnic minorities, including in Rakhine State against Rohingya in a more uh, aggressive manner. Because as many said, you know, this is the very same military committed to these crimes against humanity and genocide against the uh, Rohingya and uh, other ethnic communities, war crimes against other ethnic communities. And, um, you know, it is unacceptable uh, for the war, war uh, you know, to, 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 to stay silent on this thing. You know, we cannot just let the, you know, genocide uh, criminals and suspect to rule the country again. And now, you know, the people started to realize, you know, how not, not very in a, overwhelming majority, but some people in Myanmar started to realize the, the, the military, the, the enemy is not the Rohingya or ethnic minorities, but, but the military themselves. And they don't have color or religion or ethnicity when it's come to their brutality. And you know, the realization is there. 
but I fear they are going to use this uh, nationalism card against once they normalize the situations a little bit and divert attentions of the public to the Rohingya and uh, you know create another atrocity crimes. And that is really, really uh, something that we need to pay attention to. And most of all, you know, we cannot let this um, generals to rule the country again. We need to we need to see immediate actions from the world. You know, going back to the questions of CDMs and and uh, we can, one thing that very important to notice here is the people of Myanmar, you know, young, old, yeah, young people are initiating the movement, but their parents are supporting them. Their parents are helping them to go out and protest or to join the CDM movement and to stop going or working for the government. So, so what is more important to notice here is that people of Myanmar are ready to sacrifice and they know consequences, but they are desperately trying to stop government functions and military businesses, economy itself, by every means they can. So if people of Myanmar are willing to sacrifice for now, why not the international community? Why not international governments? Why they, what, what is their calculation is? They need to respect the people's desire. They are desperately come, calling for the help and support and actions, not declare, not the statement or you know, not, 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 not concern, but the actions. And I think if we if the people in, in Myanmar, people in on the ground and the international community are on the same page, and this fight will be win. And, and again, we have to remember that we cannot let these generals to rule the country. Mm -hmm. uh, that actually fits very nicely uh, into a question uh, from Eric Wishart, uh, club vice president. Um, he asks, you know, what impact has Aung San Suu Kyi's defense of the military over the Rohingya crisis had on the international reaction uh, to the coup? Um, do all of you see Aung San Suu Kyi as having less sort of pull or, or, or kind of star factor, right? If we, if we remember that sanctions and other responses uh, to the military in the past were, were quite solely based on, on, on her and, and, and her treatment and, and her behavior. Um, do you think it's, it's fair to say that people on the streets and hopefully the international community has been focusing less on her and, and more on the, the broader movement, the, the, the broader people of, of Myanmar? I'll, I'll let whoever jump in. I'm sure you all have thoughts on this. Um, I don't know. Should I? <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Wait, wait. <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, I will let you guys speak more, but I just wanted to raise one thing here. Um, I mean, yes, the NLD party and Aung San Suu Kyi won um, a, a landslide in the past elections in 2020, uh, right? Uh, however, all these uh, ballot, all these vote doesn't necessarily mean the people of Myanmar, all Myan majority of Myanmar, uh, the, the support her or like her, but they felt no other choice but to support her. So basically they really hate the military and they don't want the military back party get any seat. Um, so that is the reason that a lot of the people I know have voted for the uh, NLD party. Now with this movement, again, yes, they, they support, you know, uh, vast majority of Myanmar people support or love and care, respect um, the Aung San Suu Kyi. However, when a lot of young people uh, come out uh, on the street, it's not just about her anymore. It's about wanting to have a better future, wanting to have a freer future, wanting to have a country that they can aspire to live with equality, justice and respect among each other. I think that desire among the young people is something astonishing to see. And that is something that we have to recognize. And when in this movement, you know, I'm, I'm sure the NLD party calling to for the release of the detainees, the Aung San Suu Kyi women and everybody and everyone else as well. But the goal might be different for the different groups and different uh, uh, political groups, as well as the general younger people. For the um, NLD party, it might be just not only to you know to 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 return to the power to uh, uh, you know to to get the control back uh, back on the 
uh, of the government, and that is legitimate. But on the other hand, we also have to recognize countries' other major fundamental problems that we have, which is that deep ethnic divisions and these long lasting six decades long civil wars. And these younger generations and ethnic people are calling for a truly democratic uh, federal union and the, to abolish this 2008 constitution. So I think when we push for these uh, democratic, uh, uh, you know, the return for the democracy, I think this, some of these calls has to be clear from the beginning and, um, you know, so while supporting this movement. Yeah, it's not just supporting NLD, but they're holding them accountable for the principles and from the war, for, for the things that they have to be complying with, you know, regardless of we're able to return to the power or not. Mm. Uh, <laughs> Ali, <laughs> do you want to jump yeah. in? Yeah. I'll jump in. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I think, um, I mean, I do think it's important not to underestimate how much love there is for Aung San Suu Kyi here. And I think that it's easy, especially if you have a lot of, you know, a lot of the circles that we probably end up, um, you know, end up in and speaking to people who are educated, who are aware of the flaws of the NLD, who, you know, are much more guarded about their enthusiasm for them or, or actively negative about them um, but I think if you're talking about ordinary people there is a huge huge amount of of love for her still she's you know her face is still everywhere in the protests people are getting more tattoos of her I mean it's definitely she's definitely still a key figure and and uh, and a kind of unifying figure in in many ways because she because she does inspire people across the country but i think you're absolutely right that the youth the, the words they're using the things they're talking about when you actually when you actually stop and speak to them the main feeling is this fear of losing freedom of being going reverting to going back under the military and i think that that's you know in a way on sense that she's become the symbol of that because you know, she was the she was the leader. She was the, she was the de facto leader of the country, and she was detained. I mean, if that happened in any other country, it'd be completely shocking. Imagine if Joe Biden had been detained just after the election. Like it's just you know absolutely un, unheard of. So of course she's getting a huge amount of focus. Um, but you're absolutely right that like people are are really what they're worried about is going back. And I do think there's there's a there's a division in certain ways of people calling for. Um, you know, the demands are slightly separate in, in, in depending on which groups you listen to. And like you say, a lot of the, the youth and the, and the ethnic groups, um, like this general, general strike for ethnic nation nationalities, they're calling for abolishment of the 2008 constitution. This has made it clear that there's no way they can go back, we can go back to living under that constitution. It's always been known to be flawed, but this is exactly, mm -hmm. we've, all the points have been proven, everyone's vindicated, everyone who's been talking about how dangerous the constitution is has been vindicated because the military is trying to legitimize this as a legal um, process, which is um, sanctioned by the constitution, which is, which is you know, um, madness, but that's another issue. But then there's another group of people who, their main demands is the acknowledgement of the, of the 2020 elections I think some people are just beyond that like a lot of the youth they're just it's too late to to go back and look at the 2020 elections we just need to start from scratch we need a proper federal democracy and so I think yeah in terms of like people on the ground um there there's there's a mixture Dulce's image is still key it's still important it's still driving people this this red um color uh that a lot of the is also kind of linked to the NLD, but also um, student movements and stuff in the past. But it's definitely, you know, a, a theme that's c connecting people and, and being used to drive protest. But the absolute uh, overwhelming message is, is, is more about removing the military, not losing freedoms, not losing the chance at a proper future. And although the NLD is sort of a and Aung San Suu Kyi may be like a personification of that, of the change. She, it's not just about that. And I also think that the, um, when you talk about the international communities feeling towards her, um, it's interesting because she has been in so many ways, um, 
well, she's been a huge disappointment to a lot of the international community and um, her actions in defending the, uh, the military or in seeming, see, like seemingly depend, defending the military in her, in her um, appearance at The Hague has obviously angered and upset and baffled a lot of people. But I think now I'm also hearing quite a lot of people, uh, certainly apologists for her uh, during that period who are kind of vindicated as well, because they're saying, well, look, this is sh this shows she's always been beholden to them in a way because she puts one foot wrong and they'll take power. And we've now seen them do that. So some people, I think, have softened their attitude towards her, realizing that those threats that people were talking about from the military were much more real than we realized because even in the days leading up to the coup most people were not expecting it to happen and they were still seeing this as as fear-mongering from the military and empty threats from the military and now it has happened and she's imprisoned and you know goodness knows how long we're talk we're seeing raids of Dorkinji's office uh, of the of the Dorkinji um, Foundation office, sorry, um, and ob obvious investigations into her life and her work, possibly looking for more serious criminal charges to put her away for much longer. I mean, maybe they'll just put her away uh, until they can have an election that 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 she that the NLD won't will either be barred from running in or at least she won't be dropped like leading that and it won't have the same enthusiasm but maybe they'll keep her in prison for a long long time we certainly know they've done it in the past so so she it does feel like a lot of that those concerns that people were raising before are more real than we thought and i think it has made people reassess the way they reacted to her decisions in the past not all of them obviously there's still disappointment because she didn't even voice concern and there's still a huge amount of flaws of her actions i'm not i'm not trying to do that myself but i've seen other people and i've seen analysis saying that you know there is now a little bit more understanding of the position that she was in i'm, I'm wary of making it sound like i think that she, she's it's all it's all explainable i don't think that at all but i do i think that it's it has changed people's attitudes slightly can i can i just add something to that because i mean you know i've worked with um ali for a long time as well and and can, <laughs> um you know i fully agree and but the thing i think that's really um galvanized this moment is that it is an anti-coup movement it's not even a, a really a pro-democracy movement. It's really like, let's just get rid of these generals and let's make sure that our future is what we want it to be. We do have an elected government who can help us get there and, you know, recognizing that, yeah, it's a fragile democracy. But I think what's really heartening is that they also recognize, no, this isn't a stalled democracy. This is just uh, a moment in time where it's on hold and we need to grab it back before it's too late. And in some ways, the military also recognizes this. And I think that, you know, these attempts to really push forward these draconian laws and um, have these, you know, many pre-trial, um, sorry, um, yeah, pre-trial detention arrests, it's, it's really attempts and sort of desperate attempts from the, um, from the military to to try and take control of this moment when actually this momentum they know could really spill over. And I'm afraid that today may be that moment where, you know, it is violently halted, but let's see before we, before we make any conclusions. I mean, they also know that a whole international community is watching and waiting. And I just, I also wanted to refer to something that Ali mentioned earlier about, you know, squeezing the economy and the youth really being like we don't care we want the economy to be squeezed so that we can actually have an excuse for the international community to act um you know we there have been people like human rights watch who are uh, trying to persuade governments to do targeted sanctions rather than wide economic sanctions that we saw in previous years where it was prolonged and really did harm the people of myanmar but you know hearing and seeing people saying we don't care about money we don't want this like let's just nip it in the bud and do it now it's, it's just such an urgent moment for the international community to act particularly like un member states to make sure that they sign up to things like arms embargoes 
and making sure that there are targeted sanctions on these architects of the coup, including men online. I can't believe that governments are still hesitating to put targeted sanctions on him um, and his ownership of certain military conglomerates. You know, we, we're not just talking about the, the junta here, we're talking about a, a military architecture that has private business ownership. You know, why aren't we making sure that those institutions no longer benefit from business partnerships? Um, the hesitation is going to come at a very big cost for us if we wait to see what happens for the rest of the weeks and days coming, mm -hmm. particularly when we know that they are mobilizing and willing to use lethal force. Yeah. Um... I actually have just one last question here on that on that point, um, and perhaps it's it's also the the hardest question. Um, you know, sanctions in the past obviously did not work. Uh, it did not do anything to to change the military's uh, behavior in in any way. Um, you know, some some U.S. And, and and Western diplomats who were engaged in Myanmar at the time would also argue that engagement didn't work because obviously it didn't it didn't get them anywhere closer to getting what they needed from from the Tamado, any change or, or, or reform, uh, you know, wait, 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 when when you are talking to foreign governments, when when you you know in in, in your role as as a campaigner at, uh, in DC, talking to people, what are you advocating for? What what are you um, hoping um, could could come out of this in terms of the international community's response? And what do you think can actually help, you know? change change behavior when you know once and for all right if, if this is the moment right if this is the moment that they've gone too far then what what do we need to see from the international community so yes thank you for this question i you know we've been doing quite intensive advocacy for the past eight years since ever since 2012 violence against rohingya uh, happened and I want to highlight uh, at least uh, two things. Uh, one, um, you know, yes, uh, the international community um, somehow uh, put equation to the Aung San Suu Kyi being in the government as democracy. Um, and therefore, you know, they were very pro-engagement and anti-sanctions and, um, and like, I mean, I don't think that was, it was wrong to engage with the, the Aung San Suu Kyi government or, you know, this, the status that we had, this pseudo democracy or, or, or this, this, you know, the, the military design, discipline, democracy, where they shared power. Uh, international community could still engage, but yet there was a failure to act or to take actions against the military crime, military's crimes, um, you know, up until 2017, up until now, you know, when, even when we see this, uh, the, the crimes uh, occurred, the, the in gross international human rights uh, uh, crimes or, you know, the violations occurred in Rakhine State, there has never been one, we never addressed the, the military's impunity. Um, in uh, through criminal accountability processes or other accountability measures, which is like sanctioning the military or military businesses. It was extremely difficult to advocate to the foreign governments to make them understand how important it is to hold the military uh, uh, institutions and military leaders accountable to stop these crimes. And, and otherwise we would never be able to move forward as a true democracy. Uh, the military, when we had this, the military led the top-down political change in 2010, you know, we never addressed, the, we never had a period of transitional justice. So basically, mm -hmm. the military's crimes before 2010 were uh, somehow washed away, you know, you know, given impunity. And then when we had the 6, 2016 and 17, since 2012, the, all the crimes, uh, the, the, the developing over the time uh, in Rakhine State, we never had a, any uh, issue, uh, discussions about the uh, criminal accountability. On top of that, the world reluctant to put sanctions because they think it was ineffective and it might hurt the people, it might hurt the democratization period. But it was completely wrong calculations that, you know, by seeing the result today. And now, I mean, you know, again, the questions of whether sanctions is effective or not, I think it's, uh, you know, the, the some of this 
uh, experts the, the, or engagement expert, their um, calculations or their analysis is wrong. You know, because we had san sanction was part of the reason that military uh, actually uh, started, initiated this top-down change and drafted 2008 constitutions and allowed the civilian government to have some power in the gov government, right? So that was part of the reason, but now, I think sanction in our position is targeted sanctions are still working. And this is the only way that we will be able to weaken the military, um, the, the, the architecture, the military's institutions and leaders. And that is the only way that we will be able to push for the, uh, for, for the change or the return of the power. So the military, uh, the sanctions are important. On the other hand, you know, the criminal accountability for this gross human rights violations are also a key to uh, having any uh, sort of a true real change or democracy in Myanmar. Otherwise, you know, if this uh, militaries remain, um, uh, you know, held unaccountable, then they will continue, uh, we will see recurrence of the crimes. That That is for sure. So. I would support not only sanctions, but also with the focus of the criminal accountability by to take down this military general. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, Ali, do you want to jump in on that at all? Um, yeah, I'll just quickly say I, I, I think sanctions are always a difficult one because there's so uh, it, there's so much experience from the past that show that they haven't been effective. I think there are ways to do it better than we have. I think that and I totally understand that why people call on them because at least like where we says you know it's showing that they can't that, that that this is not being accepted so it's a kind of um in a way that the implementing of sanctions is a kind of public ticking off in itself i, I and it, i'm torn between the military don't really care they'll just carry on as they you know they're not that bothered by the way they come across but i do think that um you know, if you do, as as we mentioned, like sanction individuals and, um, you know, or family members even stop them from traveling, perhaps that's going to then have an impact on, you know, their golfing holiday plans and so on. Um, but I think it's, it, it's always slightly flawed because obviously, you know, even if you're targeted with your focus of sanctions um, on things like uh, military companies, um, a lot of the market for those companies, for those products are not going to the West anyway, or people who are likely to jump on board easily with sanctions. It does need to be a more of a global response for it to have any impact because, you know, seeing Joe Biden saying that the, that the US is going to um, sanction the jade companies is not going to have an impact because the the americans are not the people buying jade it's china it's you know and it you need you need asean you need china you need other countries to get on board i think for there to be an impact and if that happened you know perhaps it would have and you know and and obviously it's difficult i don't have a better solution so <laughs> it's difficult to criticize that but I just see them, I do see flaws in them. And, um, but yeah, I think that the key is to get as many people on board as possible to get a sort of unified response from the globe, which is easier said than done. But um, uh, yeah, it's a difficult one. And, um, and, but, and I also know that people here want to want to feel heard and that that is also part of it, you know, like putting sanctions on, showing that people are listening is also going to kind of hopefully keep people feel feeling like they're not alone and 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 that will keep spirits high and uh, yeah, there, there are other other positive things but but i am also very worried about the economy here i'm worried about the impact and i think what always happens with with uh, when something uh negative happens in a country is you get an immediate response of um a lot of donors to international ngos or local ngos freaking out and pulling back money because they think oh it just doesn't look good at the moment to be sending money to a country that's under military rule even if their money is going to press freedom organizations or you know humanitarian work even like uh, they just quite often put a freeze on things and that can also have a detrimental impact so there are there are definitely 
reasons for it, but I, I also see flaws and I'm, I'm always cautious of jumping on board too much with sanctions, even though I see, I see the appeal and, and don't think they should, we should give up on that strategy. Just, just to add one, one, one thing on that. Um, I understand a lot of people frustrations around, around sanctions, but you know, you see people in Myanmar, they are already started, uh, already starting this boycott military product campaign. So they have already taken initiative while we are asking international governments to put sanctions on the military's companies and military product. And that's the reality we have to understand. And that's the reality and the people desire we need to listen to. And, mm. uh, and I agree on the collective international uh, response, uh, you know, I think will be, will be the most effective way to respond to this situation. So that is why I think we are encouraging many, many uh, policymakers and government to reach out to their partners and to come up with the collective uh, uh, sanctions and collective respond to the situations in general, including global arms embargo and the addressing the uh, accountability issues as, as well. I mean, otherwise, yes, you're right, you know, if not going to be very effective, but I think, you know, if we don't put the sanctions on, you know, the military will get another free pass. You know, that is the least, the last thing and the softest action that international community could take at this point. If we don't do that, so, you know, the, the, the military will feel like, yeah, we get another free pass, you know, pa free pass by free pass. And, you know, it will give them license to kill more people and, you know, yeah. And event, eventually, maybe this time Rohingya will just disappear. You know, Mei Aung Hwai once said they are carrying out and finish business. Maybe they will finish this business this time, right? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that um, that's definitely true. This this the idea that they, if you if we don't do something, if sanctions aren't 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 put on, then it's almost like people are saying that they can get away with it or you know yeah it's you've got to make the message clear this is not okay and i think sanctions are a good way of doing that even if the actual strategy doesn't necessarily work as effectively but but making it clear that 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 the that what they've done is not been accepted is is key because otherwise like you say they're just going to continue to plow forward with impunity yeah so, so i mean uh I just, sorry, I know I know you really <laughs> run out of time, but again, when we're talking about these threats and these these um, actions that go unpunished and with impunity, I mean, I wanted to read out the the screen grab from the MRTV broadcast yesterday, which was point five. It's found that the protesters have raised their incitement towards riot and anarchy mob on the day of twenty second of February, which is today. Protests are now inciting the people, especially emotional teenagers and youths, to a confrontation path where they will suffer the loss of life. I mean, that if that isn't a threat, then I don't know what that is. And if the military are allowed to continue with impunity to threaten civilians in that way, we do need to do something that's going to squeeze them out. And, you know, unfortunately, there will be unintended consequences, but that's why I think when we mention the words targeted sanctions, it has to be done in a really strategic way. And yes, in a unified way where it is actually done by a number of countries rather than just, you know, rather than just the status quo. Yeah. Well, I feel like that was an extremely quick hour, really flew by. Um, I really appreciate all of you um, joining the panel today. I mean, I, I couldn't think of, of better voices to speak to what's happening in, in Myanmar. And again, a, a special thanks to Ali, who's magically connecting through an internet lockout. It's really pretty remarkable and quite rare for us, I think, to have, you know, a re real insight from somebody who's been covering this on, on, on the ground. So I, I really, really do appreciate it. Um, and, and yeah, um, thank you. Thank you so much for your for your time uh, and uh, thank you to our viewers uh, uh, for tuning in. Um, thanks so much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you uh, all Bye. of you and uh, everybody joining. And, and stay safe as well, please. Yeah. Yes, Ali. <laughs>